We might get going. Uh, other people might um, drift in or whatever as they sort of find their, app, uh, their way around our site. There's a bit of a debate about whether we should use these venues that are quite far apart but are quite nice, or whether we should have sort of bunched everything together so it'd be easier to find. Um, so we just sort of resource moving people around. Um, so, just as a little bit of background. Um, I'm Greg Ashman. I, um, I came to Clarendon in 2010. I was a deputy uh, principal of a government high school in London. And I came to Clarendon in 2010. My wife, uh, who's, who definitely won't be here, she's here today, but she won't be in this talk. Um, she uh, is from Ballarat. Um, and we decided that it was a better place for women than two girls. So I pitched up here, um, and um, Jan and David um, were very passionate about using education research. So I read John Hattie's Visible Learning. I'm now actually not convinced by Hattie's approach, um, but from Visible Learning I, I read about a paper that Daisy mentioned this morning, um, Why Minimal Guidance During Instruction Does Not Work, by um, Paul Kirshner, um, John Sweller, and Dick Clark. And that sort of sent me on a journey. In 2015, I started doing a PhD um, at the University of New South Wales uh, in instructional design, technically, but basically cognitive load theory under the supervision of John Sweller and Slava Kal Yuga, who, for those of you that are interested, discovered the expertise reversal effect. I finished that PhD last year, um, so an now PhD in cognitive load theory, essentially. And I recently wrote a little book meant to be little, so it's an, the, the idea is that for busy teachers it's a quick primer for, so that they can get their heads around cognitive load theory. And it's really some of the thinking behind that book that I'm going to talk about today in this introduction. It's interesting. It aligns a lot with what Daisy was saying, um, cognitive load theory. And I've mentioned as I, my role as sort of MC of these things, apart from now, is usually to wander around and take photos of talks and post them to the Twitter account. And as I went around the talks, quite a few people were mentioning cognitive load theory. So it's obviously part of uh, the discussion in Australia now, in a way that it perhaps wasn't in 2010. This is Dylan William. So maybe that's 2017. And I think since 2017, the profile of cognitive load theory has risen. But it does raise the question as to why uh, William thinks it is the single most important thing for teachers to know. And I will explain that along the way. And it might be surprising, for those of you that are uh, familiar with cognitive load theory, it might be surprising William's reasoning for this, which I, I've obviously, I don't, can't speak for William, but I think I have a grasp of why he says this. So the origins of cognitive load theory. So John Sweller, um, I think he was initially going to be a dentist or something, I can't, but it, anyway, he, whatever it was he was going to do, he didn't get on with it, and he's at university, and he starts studying psychology, and he goes into graduate work, and he's looking at problem solving. And he hasn't yet made up cognitive load theory, he hasn't made it up yet, so, but he's doing some experiments, and, and the, this experiment that I'm going to describe is probably the foundational experiment of cognitive load theory, even though the field did not yet exist. What he did is he got university students uh, to solve a series of problems. So the problems, they were given a starting number and they were given a target number. And they had to get from the starting number to the target number using a combination of only two rules. You could either multiply by three or subtract 69. Those are the only two problem solving moves you're allowed to use. So you had to do that um, to get from there to there. And these are the solutions to each of the problems that he asked. And notice, in each case, the solution involves simply alternating the moves. Different lengths, so this is times 3 minus 69, this is times 3 minus 69, times 3 minus 69. This is times 3, you can read it yourself. So there's a pattern. So it's not, you're never going to get from A to B by subtracting 69 two times in a row, or multiplying by 3 two times in a row. You've got to use that particular order. Now, the students weren't told this. So they would go from there to there, 
they go from there to there. They were undergraduate students, um, I think in psychology. They were generally able to solve all the problems. So they'd take a while to solve this one here. They'd take, it'd take them a while, but they were generally able to solve it. They were able to get from there to there. What they didn't do was notice the pattern. Now, when he actually, when he actually prompted people to look for a pattern, they didn't notice the pattern, and they started using it. But those who simply solved the problems without any prompting about there being a pattern did not notice a pattern. Now, I find it hard to picture this, because you'd think, wouldn't you, that after you'd done three of these, you'd, it would be the whole way of it. We'd just, change, we'd just do one and the other. But no, they didn't. Now, um, Swallow started to think there was something funny going on here, and he related it to what he knew about problem solving, and a problem solving strategy that we all have, it's a natural problem solving strategy, called means ends analysis. And the way means ends analysis works is basically, I know I want to be here. Yes, that's the goal state. I know I am here. Okay? So I then try a move. It doesn't get me close to the goal state, so that doesn't work. So I try another move. It doesn't get me close to the goal state, so that doesn't work. And then I try another move. Oh, I'm closer to the goal state now. So then you repeat the process from there. It's called means ends analysis. <coughs> and Sweller suggested that basically this process of means ends analysis is really taxing, cognitively taxing. It requires a lot of processing. And you've been primed by Daisy to think about working memory and long term memory. So I, I will talk about that later, but we, we, essentially what we're doing is we are filling up that limited working memory with this process of means-end analysis. That's what we're doing. And um, because of that, there is no capacity left to notice patterns. It's just not, there's nothing remaining. We're too busy. Our working memory is too busy. Now, this links to William, because one of the things that William thinks is so important about cognitive load theory is, is something we probably say the least about it, but it is related to this. Notice that students can be successful at solving the problems without learning the significant detail. Students can be active, active, solving problems, yet they don't learn as a result of that. And this is what Dylan William thinks is important, because I think in education, there's an assumption, generally, that if kids are active, busy doing something educational, they will learn from that process. And we don't have to be that specific about it, exactly what it is they're going to learn. But this demonstrates a clear example of where they don't. And I related this to um, an experience I had as a baby science teacher um, you know, many years ago. And I would, I, I would to teach uh, training college, I was taught, you know, that constructivist instruction was effective, that, that, that science should be taught through inquiry learning, that kids should figure things out by doing experiments, all of which is not right. Um, and I think we're still teaching it to trainee teachers. So I went into the classroom, and one of the things I, I did was I wanted to, I, I did this experiment called the marble chip experiment. And basically what you do is you get these marble chips, marble chips react with acid. So you put these marble chips in the acid and you collect the gas as it comes off and it goes into this syringe and the syringe rubber comes out. And then you time how long it's taking the syringe to come out. And you use different sized marble chips. And these different sized marble chips, the idea is that the smaller the marble chips, the faster the reaction because they've got a larger surface area. So the syringe basically comes out quicker than if you use large marble chips and the syringe comes out more slowly. Um, so, that's what they were supposed to figure out. But we'd do this experiment. There'd be a lot of activity. It would work perfectly. They'd get all the chips measured out the right amount, put in the, um, put in the beakers and the, what were they, conical flasks with the bungs. And all. It all worked perfectly. And you'd say, OK, so what have you found out from that? None of them could tell me that the smaller the marble chips, the greater the rate of reaction. So again, very active, but not learning the key principle. In this case, it's not because they're doing means ends analysis. They're not trying to figure out how to do the experiment for themselves. They're told. But the details of that, as Daisy was talking about this morning, they're just overwhelming. You know, take this here, put that there, do this, do that, 
Where do I get this from? Oh, we're out of uh, acid. Where do I get that, Mr. Ashman? Blah, 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 blah. And by the time they've done all that, there's nothing left in the working memory to notice the pattern. So here's the first key principle, if you like, of cognitive load theory, the, the one that we, we talk about the least. Students can be active solving problems or completing investigations without learning key concepts. And I think one of the things about cognitive load theory that it's, it forces us to do is really interrogate what it is we want the students to learn. I think if you have a kind of activity philosophy where you believe that just doing something educational will kind of um, academic skills and knowledge will rub off onto the students, you don't have to be specific about exactly what it is you want them to learn. Cognitive load theory makes us think about that a little bit more and be quite specific. And I think it focuses what we do even more as a result of that. Okay. So that's the first principle. The second, categories of knowledge. And Daisy talked about this as well. She talked about this in response to a question at the end of her talk. This is a ancient Sumerian clay tablet. And it's got indentations on it made with a stylus, a little bit of wood that's been designed for the purpose. And this, we think, is the earliest form of writing. If it's not the earliest, it's one of the earliest forms of writing. And it evolved over a very long time. So it started as simply just, um, I think they were like uh, agreements of, of who loaned someone what in terms of um, you know, agricultural produce or something. And so they initially just represented numbers. But over time, the writing evolved into the sort of writing that we um, might recognise today. And this is, a, this is one of those examples. Now, this is about 5,000 years ago. So writing has been around for about 5,000 years. For most of the time since then, writing has been the preserve of an elite, a, a clerical class, often literally clerical, often um, priests and things like that, who would be the people that were tasked with writing. Um, many people wouldn't write. The, the, the English kings in the Middle Ages who couldn't write. Mass literacy has only been around since about the 19th century, and that's only in certain countries. It's still not, unfortunately, um, universal everywhere in the world. So what does this mean? Well, it means that even if the ability to read and write sort of made you more successful um, in having offspring, um, which I'm not entirely convinced that it would do, but I don't know, maybe it does. Even if it made you more successful compared to your non-reading and writing peers in having healthy uh, offspring, there couldn't be enough time, there hasn't possibly been enough time for evolution to have affected uh, the process by which we learn to read and write. Because we only invented writing relatively recently uh, this is of condensed human uh, existence into um, a 24-hour day. I, I've, I've taken a bit of license here, but no one really knows when the first anatomically modern humans arose. It's, the, the estimates vary, but I've, I've taken probably the best ones I could find. And then you put that together. So the anatomically modern humans, uh, midnight... <coughs> 10.34, the next day the first farmers arrive. 11.24 is when the Sumerian writing appears. And 11.59, one minute before midnight, is where we have mass literacy. So that gives you some sort of idea um, of how recent <coughs> this invention is. Yet, presumably, for much of this time, we've been talking to each other. Um, possibly even before anatomically modern humans arrived. Well, well we did... Obviously, we didn't just start talking to each other one day. It, that process itself evolved over many uh, tens of thousands of millions of years. So we've been talking to each other for a very long time. This means that it's possible for evolution to have affected that. And so what we think, what, what uh, we think in the field of cognitive load theory, is that evolution has affected that. And so essentially, our, our minds are primed for learning our local language. And for a whole load of other things, like... Uh, creating a men mental map of your local area, folk physics, folk psychology, understanding of the <coughs> intentions. These are all things that were sort of primed by evolution to learn. 
Writing can't be one of those things. Um, because they're just, it just, it, it's not feasible that it can be affected by evolution. Clearly, the two things are linked. Um, reading and writing are linked to speaking and listening. So we're not talking, when we're talking about categories of knowledge, we're not talking about things that are completely different. We're talking about things, that, one thing that sits on top of the other. So, biologically primary knowledge is this stuff that we've evolved with quite effortlessly, such as speaking and listening in our mother tongue. Biologically secondary knowledge, this is the stuff that's not been enough time to evolve ways of acquiring it. And if you notice what those things are, we're talking about the business that we're in. It's all the stuff we do at school. Schools were created, maybe a slightly provocative um, assertion, but I think it's justifiable. Schools were created in order to pass on sec biologically secondary knowledge. In, um, in cultures that don't have uh, writing, in traditional cultures, there are no schools. Cognitive load theory applies to biologically secondary knowledge. So you don't need cognitive load theory if you want kids to learn how to speak and listen or... It's interesting, some people talk about um, socialisation, and that's a really interesting area because, um, yes, we, we must have evolved a capacity to learn so, sort of social rules and social norms. We must have evolved that capacity because it happens in every human society. So does that mean we don't need to instruct kids in it? Um, well, tell that to an early years teacher. They think that that's probably quite important to instruct kids in social skills. Just because we can um, pick up biologically primary knowledge without any instruction doesn't necessarily mean that's always optimal. And it could be that some of the, the things that we pick up um, might be evolutionarily advantageous, but they might not be best for society. Yes? So some people can be very do very well by being um, uh, socially um, uh, maladapted, in a way. And that's not the right word for it. What am I trying to say? Socially, uh, anyway. I think you know what I'm trying to say. Um, so that's an interesting separate question, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about biologically secondary knowledge, and that's what cognitive load theory applies to. I'm going to try and leave some time for questions at the end. So, Okay, so, models of the mind. Now, I like to talk about uh, a little bit about um, what science is at this point. Now, you might think oh, that's a bit deep. What are you doing, Matt? A lot of the criticism I get when I talk about cognitive load theory is based, I think, on a misunderstanding of what cognitive load theory is and what scientific theories are. And um, cognitive load theory, like all scientific theories, will be wrong in some way. Necessarily so. Because all theories are approximations. And uh, they don't fully describe the world. So some people, for instance, say, oh, Newton, Newton was wrong because Einstein came along and proved him wrong. Well, no. Uh, Newton's laws work extremely well in many circumstances. And no one ever claimed, has ever claimed really, or perhaps they have, Perhaps that's, but the idea of a, of a scientific model being absolutely fully perfect and correct, it, it's, it's got to be a simplification. Um, and cognitive load theory is a simplification. Why, why would it have value then? Why am I going to teach about something that must ultimately break down and must be a simplification of reality? Because it's useful to make predictions. That's why we have science, because we can use our scientific models to make predictions. So, for instance, cognitive load theory doesn't talk about... Um, the, uh, about sensory memory. Sensory memory definitely exists. Definitely exists, but it's not in the cognitive load theory's model of the mind. That doesn't invalidate cognitive load theory. It's not really relevant to what cognitive load theory is talking about. So the way we simplify <coughs> to have a model that's coherent is that we don't talk about that. So I'm just putting that out there straight away. It's not meant to be a full and complete and accurate description of the human mind. It's definitely not... And we certainly don't know, like, I'm going to say that the model of mind we're using is working memory and long-term memory. We don't know where they are. I mean, maybe neuroscientists are working on that. Cognitive science and neuro, well, cognitive load theory is not neuroscience. It doesn't say the working memory is in this bit of the brain here and it uses these neurons. It's not like that. It's a, 
It's a bit like a London tube map guide of what the mind is. It's, it's meaning, but it's not, um, it, it's not telling you exactly mechanically how it all functions. So this is the model of the mind. We've got a working memory that's extremely limited. We've got a long-term mem memory that, to all intents and purposes, is limitless. It's effectively limitless. No one's ever yet come up against the limits of the human long-term memory. There must be limits, but we haven't explored them. Um, new learning, and remember this is biologically secondary. Biologically primary knowledge can just get straight into long-term memory somehow. We don't know exactly how. Biologically secondary knowledge has to pass through the working memory, and the working memory is extremely limited. Now, when I first came across this idea, I thought, well, that's a bug, isn't it? Well, why would the human mind be designed that way? It's obviously like, suboptimal. Surely we want to be able to put more stuff into long-term memory more quickly. Well, it's actually a, a form of quality control. Because if everything you read and everything you watched just sort of went into your long-term memory and formed interconnected schemas, your long-term memory would be a riot of different things, some of which are not particularly useful, some of which are not particularly accurate. So this is really a process. The, the fact that we don't remember everything and the fact that actually actively retrieving it boosts our um, <coughs> memory of a concept is a form of quality control because it's the most useful concepts that you come across most often that then get in there. It's meant to be like that. Um, new learning, so sort of new learning drips, drips, drips into the long-term memory from the working memory. But, and Daisy alluded to this as well, um, the stuff we've got in long-term memory is our superpower. So, if you've studied algebra at any level, like high school level algebra, and I say to you, 3x is 18, 3x equals 18, pretty much, without any further prompting, you, you will have in your head that x equals 6. You're just, it's in there. Now, why is that? Well, it's not a fact that you know. Like, you don't know, you haven't memorized the answers to every possible algebra question. What you've done is you've actually solved that problem. And, that, and solving that problem is quite deep. You need to know that 3x means 3 times x. You know that if 3x equals 18, you need to know that that equal sign means that the 3x is equivalent to the 18 on the other side of the equal sign, that's what it means. You need to know that if you divide the 3x by 3, you'll need to divide the 18 by 3. You'll, you'll need to know, and this probably is a fact, that 18 divided by 3 is 6. You've probably got that as a fact. But that's a whole process. Yet you've conducted that process without any effort at all. Because it's, it's just come to you. You just know. This is telling us that in the long-term memory, once we've created schemas in long-term memory, schemas of interconnected facts and relationships, and we can process those almost without effort. And this is our superpower, because this then means that we can do, although we've got this limit of about four items that we can process at any one time in working memory, that doesn't apply at all. It completely falls away for uh, knowledge in long-term memory. We can do amazing things with knowledge in long-term memory. If I say to you the word democracy, all sorts of things will be triggered and will come to mind. Effortlessly. And this is, I keep talking about schemas, and I realize I haven't actually told you what one is yet. Um, <laughs> essentially, um, the, the, the mind is not like um, a library. Uh, in, in two really important ways. Firstly, in a library, things are organized in, essentially in an arbitrary way, alphabetically. Um, and your mind doesn't do that. It organizes things in terms of their relationships to each other. So here we've got a schema for um, marsupials. Now, we're, we're learning about a new uh, marsupial. We've got to fit it into this schema. And that, notice how schema connects to other things. Herbivores. Uh, this is an error. I thought I'd put that in there. Schemas don't have to be correct. You can learn wrong things. This, this person thinks a platypus is a marsupial. It's not. It's a monotreme. But that's a schema of internet, and that would then you have a schema for carnivores that this connects to, a schema for extinction that it connects to, a schema for herbivores, um, and you pop, pop your new 
uh, Crestal Bulgarian and you are connected to marsupials and carnivores. And that's what a schema looks like. So it's not like a library. It's also, um, at, at a deeper level, quite different. Because in a library, yes, you've got someone walking around, picking books off the shelves. And we sometimes think of the mind in that way. Um, if you've seen the, the Pixar movie Inside Out, you see the little, little characters inside the mind pulling levers and making the little girl do things. And then they go to the memories, and the memories are all arranged in rows, and they pick one off the shelf. Well, that's not an explanation of anything, is it? That, that idea of, a, of a, a little character in the mind moving around, that's a, called a homunculus. And it, it's a paradox. It, it, it forms a paradox, because if the, the homunculus is controlling the person, what's controlling the homunculus? homunculus what's telling the homunculus what to do? And, in fact, what's going on with our schemas is not so much that some um, character in our mind is going along and picking them out, and saying, I'll use this one now. Now I'll use that one. It's more that the, that, that's what we're thinking with. We're thinking with the schemas. We're, we're using them. So it's less like a library and more like a tool shed. That we're, we're using the different schemas to do our thinking. When, you, when I say 3x is eight, equals 18 and you, and you know x is 6, your schema has done the work for you. Your schema has done the thinking. So how do we evolve schemas? Ah, I don't know. Um, can't answer that. It's obviously a part of human cognition, but um, yeah, I wouldn't know how they, how they evolve. We do have them, we have biologically primary schemas. So you'll develop a schema for, say, dogs without anyone instructing you in what a dog is and or what different types of dogs are. You'll just get that through exposure to, that's called folk biology. <coughs> so, anyway, no, no, how schemas evolve. Okay, does cognitive load theory model the mind as a computer? Does cognitive load theory model the mind as a computer? I'm going to ask you to answer this question, and I want you to do that in a second, not until I say so, please. I want you to do that for yes, it does, and that for no, it doesn't. And I'm going to count you down in front of your face. Don't wait until you see, see what other people do. do all at the same time, okay? So three, two, one. One and show. Okay, most people say no. And those people are correct. <coughs> but this is a common misconception. Uh, it's been put about by a uh, chap called Professor Guy Claxon. He wrote a book um, last year, maybe the year before. And he said one of the problems with cognitive load theory is it models the mind as a computer. And then uh, two Australian professors repeated this claim in the age. Um, the, the cognitive load theory does not model the mind as a computer. But it's, under, it's understandable why people who are not really fully up on what cognitive load theory is would think so. Because um, certainly the most common model of working memory, which was developed by Badley and Hitch in the 1970s, uh, is based on um, a computer model. So when computers were invented, People looked at computers and thought, oh, computers do things sim that minds do, sort of, so can we use a computer to model the mind? Well, uh, what would that look like? And so Badley and Hitch came up with this model of working memory in which uh, you had a central executive, which is like the central processing unit of a computer, and the central executive controls these things called, like, called the uh, visual spatial sketch pad and the um, language module, essentially. So the central executive is controlling what these things do. And it's quite useful in a way, because it leads to some of cognitive load theory's effects, because, because we deal with visual information differently to um, auditory information, you can sort of use that in a way to, to actually process more items at a, at a time, and it's a useful effect in cognitive load theory. But this central executive is a problem. It's like the little homunculus walking around the brain. If the central executive is controlling the working memory, what's controlling the central executive? Now, in a computer, it's a computer program, which someone else has written. So ultimately, we are. Now, I know that this gets a bit deep in the age of AI, but essentially, even in AI, you can trace the machine learning back to the original machine learning algorithm. So there is something that controls it. But in a, in a human mind, if, if you're going to say 
that the mind, the working memory has a central executive, it raises the obvious question, what controls the central executive? And this was the criticism that Guy Claxton levelled against cognitive load theory. But of course, it was, it was flawed because it was based on the assumption that that's what cognitive load theory says, and it does not. Instead, cognitive load theory says that the mind is a natural in information processing system, and the nearest analogy for that is evolution. So, in evolution, you've got information, and the information is in the genome. And that information gets processed, because we know that over time, um, different species evolve, different individuals with slightly different characteristics evolve. And over time, by an interaction with the environment and the process of natural selection, um, more complex species or more better adapted species can evolve. So the information in the genome is processed somehow. And one of the things about evolution when it was um, first, put, um, first proposed by uh, Charles Darwin in the 19th century is that evolution does not require a central processor. And this was the thing that worried people about it. This is why people were worried about evolution and its relationship to religion, because it didn't require a creator or an intelligent person driving the process. And so this is why, then whatever you think about that, I don't want to offend anyone or whatever, but that's clearly, objectively, when it was put forward, this is an issue that people had with it. And it doesn't necessarily require intervention because an interaction between the environment and the organism can lead to these adaptions. So this is a better model for the mind than a computer because a computer has a central processor that requires to instructions of us what to do, whereas evolution does not. And so what cognitive load theory proposes is that the mind is a similar kind of information processor to the process of evolution. So the mind, the large store of information is the long-term memory of an individual. Evolution, large store of information, information is the genome of a population. Now that's a little bit vague, what's a population, but let's just skip over that. The mind obtains information from others via instruction. Evolution obtains information from others via, via sex and plasmids if you're a bacteria. Um, oh, well, yeah. The mind generates new information by random generate and test, which is essentially that means end analysis thing that we were talking about earlier. Evolution generates new information by mutation. Now, have I got that slide? What's the time? So, what does this mean? It means that you don't need a central processor. What's actually happening is your, your attention, your working memory is controlled by an interaction between your long-term memory and, the, and a stimulus from the environment. So to give you an example of that, um, if I give you the task, I'm going to give you a task to do, okay? So this is your task. For the next few seconds, do not think of a white bear. <laughs> yes? So that demonstrates that a stimulus from the environment, me saying something, causes and it interacts with your long-term memory and focuses the attention of your working memory. And that's essentially what we're saying is going on. Here. Does it need a central processing unit? Working memory is limited, but we can get around those limitations by drawing on knowledge from long-term memory. So, um, when have we got till? If this finishes at 12.25, doesn't it? Yes, well, it must be 12.25. So I'll try and leave a few minutes for questions. Um, these are, the, these are the, we're known as the simple cognitive load theory effects, and they're all relevant to teaching. Um, and... Um, they all sort of were discovered in the early part of the development of the theory in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. And I'm not going to talk about them all at great length because um, that would be a bit tedious, but they are useful to know about. And so I'd encourage you to look at them. And there's an interesting paper. If you Google cognitive load theory 20 years, you'll get um, an article that explains all of these effects in some detail. I also write about them in my book. Now here's, here's the first one. This is the first one to be discovered. This is the goal-free effect. Um, if you ask students to solve this problem, find x, they learn less than if you give them that and tell them to figure out whatever they can. Which is nice, because why? Why would that happen? 
Because when you ask them to find x, they've got to use um, means ends analysis, which is extremely taxing on working memory. When you don't give them a goal, they don't have to do that. They can just find out whatever they want and they learn more. The problem with it is uh, this only really works for very well defined maths type problems. Um, it, geometry problems, really. Uh, it's hard to think of how to use this in other ways. It, 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 anyway. Anything that's a bit more open-ended than falls down. Worked example effect. So, this is probably, um, this is what most people would say is a foundational effect of cognitive load theory. Um, but I, I said it was that idea that you don't necessarily learn by activity. Um, so, Year 9 students, okay, now this is important. I think people get the worked example effect wrong. Um, again, one of the myths about cognitive load theory is that it was all um, developed in labs with university students. It wasn't. Um, this is mainly done with Year 8 and 9 students at Sydney High Schools. Um, you, you've got Year 9 students who actually know algebra, right? So they've got some basic algebra principles. They're not completely clueless. All of them you give some worked examples to of the kind of problem they're going to be solving. Then, you split them into two. One group has a series of two identical problems to solve. So to solve two problems, solve two problems, solve two problems. The other group, one of the two problems is a worked example. So worked example, problem, worked example, problem, worked example, problem. So that's the difference. So they all know some algebra, they're all given a worked example, but then you go through this process, the, bit, the difference between two problems, problem, worked example, two problems, problem. And you find that the students who are given the worked example um, do better than the ones that are given just the problems to solve. Well, why? Because then uh, novices, um, if this reverses, this is Slava Karl Yuga's expertise reversal effect. If you've got people who are e relatively expert at doing this, they're better off solving problems than studying worked examples. It reverses for those people. Um, but for novices learning, it's too much to, um, too consuming of cognitive load solving the problems. They don't learn as much as if they've got this, which gives them something to pay attention to, gives them a form to follow, reduces the cognitive load, um, more guidance. And it's the general idea that for novices, you need to, they need more guidance and less open-ended problem solving. This is an example of the split attention effect. If I give you this diagram, which is fairly typical of like a 1970s textbook, uh, you've got to go, what's one? One is this thing, so what's two? Two there, and you have to split your attention between the two things. Uh, if instead students are given an integrated diagram like that, they learn more. And these are all run in little randomised controlled trials with small numbers of students. This illustrates the redundancy effect. Uh, redundancy is when you provide information, any information that is not required. In this case, this just repeats what the diagram shows. So what you've got to do is you've got to process that, realise it's just repeating what the diagram says and then dismiss it. And that consumes working memory resources. And we do this a lot. I do this, I've, I've, I've done this a lot in my time. Um, but redundancy doesn't necessarily mean it repeats. It could be anything that is not needed, that you've got to process but is not needed. Have a read of that. <laughs> So if I just started talking about that and didn't give you time to read it, or I started reading it out, you've got to decide whether you can listen to me and look at the slide. Um, I'm going to stop shortly. This is what I was talking about. If you present information simultaneously in audio and visually, you can actually process it more because it's processed as two separate channels in working memory, we think. Uh, element interactivity. Uh, slightly confusingly illustrated with a periodic table of elements. That's not the sort of element we're talking about. So these four items that you can process at any one time in your working memory are elements. Um, but here, so if you wanted to learn all the symbols for all the elements in the periodic table, that would be painful and it wouldn't be much fun. But you could do it. And at any particular point in time, you would only have to consider one thing, the name and the symbol. So all those, although all these things sit together in a table, you can pick them off one at a time. So we say the element interactivity is low. Um, here, 
if you want to learn how to balance this equation, well, whatever you do to this oxygen here is going to have con consequences over here and over here. So everything interacts with everything. So those interactions themselves become things memory. A lot harder to learn how to do that than to learn those symbols. In now, so this is higher in elementary interactivity for novices. But of course, once someone has become relatively expert at balancing equations, they're going to do that in their long-term memory with little effort at all, just like the 3x is 18. And so the element interactivity lowers. So element interactivity is dependent on the task that you ask students to do, uh, students to do but it also is dependent on the student's level of expertise. Complex cognitive load theory effects. We talked about in, uh, so element interactivity effect. It's harder to learn stuff with higher element interactivity, but that will depend on the task and also the level of expertise of the student. So element interactivity is not a property of the task alone. Expertise, a reversal effect we talked about. Guidance fading effect. Um, basically, um, as people become more expert, you can start fading the guidance. A classic example of this is a completion problem effect where rather than just giving them a worked example, you give them a worked example with bits missing for them to complete. It means that they then have to process it, but of course it only works if they've got relatively more expertise than initially when they were just given the worked examples. Uh, and there's various other ones which I probably won't talk about. Um, collective working memory effect is a weird one. I'm not talking about it, so I'll shut up. Um, this is... Um, <clears throat> so if you've got something that's really low in element interactive, one of the mis another misconception about quantum flow theory is that it's always about reducing cognitive load. Uh, if you've got something that is intrinsically really low in element interactivity, you actually want to increase cognitive load. So when researchers ask undergraduates to learn pairs of words like this, very low in element interactivity, if they got them to complete the second word rather than just tell them the two words in a list, they actually learn, they remember them better. So, so there are some cases where element interactivity is really low, where you actually want to optimize it, because you want it to be at about three or four elements you don't want it to be more than that, but you also don't want it to be less, because otherwise there's nothing to process. Uh, there's no, re no thought for there to be a residue of. Um, you might have heard of that, and then that's about luck. Um, and I was going to talk about measuring cognitive load, but I think we'll go to any questions, because we've only got a few minutes. Any questions? Yes? As you were talking, I was thinking, where, what role does our our experience as a human finding our ability to be able to do things better. And then you came up with the example of the periodic table. Um, are those interactions, the way that those things interact, is that similar to our human experiences and how we, how we accumulate skills and knowledge and... I don't know, um, yeah, look, the, the, uh, the more we do I think, something, the, you know... Yeah, I, I think it, it would come back to this idea of categories of knowledge. So, uh, if it's something that's biologically primary, you, you tend to just learn it through lots of experience of just being involved in it. Uh, if it's biologically secondary, it often has to be quite effortful. You have to put in some sort of effort to learn it. Um, uh, so, I'm not sure whether that fully answers your question, but... Um, we can do that with experiences too, though. Yes, it's, yeah, well, absolutely. It's more effort than but all learning involves some kind of experience, yes. Um, another question? Yes? I suppose, uh, look, um, what I'm wondering if you've learned something wrong, hmm. then how do, you, how do you use cognitive load theory to try, uh, or what steps would be necessary to unlearn that to okay. recode it? It's a really good question. Cognitive load theory doesn't have much to say on this, but Stellan Olson. Does. It's, it's theory of non-monotomic change. I'll break it down really, um, I'll give you a really, really basic version of my understanding of it. We often think that to change someone's uh, incorrect view, and often so, some things that we learn that are biologically primary, like folk physics, actually conflict with actual physics, with biologically secondary physics. And we, all, we, we tend to think you've got to challenge it somehow, so there's this idea of cognitive conflict. So you get kids to make predictions about what's going to happen in an experiment using their folk physics, and then you demonstrate to them that that's not right, and then that, that will change their view. It doesn't work very well. Uh, it, 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 there's, no, there's not much evidence to support that approach. 
what, what, what does seem to work well is you give people an idea, you give them lots of situations where that idea works, and eventually the new idea sort of outcompetes the old idea and becomes the one that you go to first. The bad idea never goes. Nothing is ever erased from long-term memory. It could, it could, its retrieval strength could drop, but it's still there. So you have to give new ideas that sort of outcompete the older ones. Uh, one more question. Yes? Um, so you were talking before about steam methods. Yes. I wonder, like, it's easier for things to go into our long-term memory if they connect into a schema. Well, like you had the example of the, some type of animal yeah. coming into that schema. So as teachers, are we wanting to try and like make that link really explicit for the children, something already in their long-term memory? The, the answer is yes, but... We don't know exactly what these schemas look like, so it's a bit of a guessing game as to how they connect up with each other. But yes, you definitely want to focus on the meaning of things. Um, so like when you cube things using like um, the first letter, um, that's not as useful for kids than queuing it through its meaning uh, and relationships with something else. We're done for time, folks, so... Um, if you need help getting to your next location, there will be three of us outside.